James I, King of Scotland from 1406, was the son of King Robert III and Annabella Drummond. He was the last of three sons and by the time he was eight both of his elder brothers were dead a year Robert had died in infancy but David, Duke of Rothesay died suspiciously in Falkland Castle while being detained by his uncle, Robert, Duke of Albany. Although Parliament exonerated Albany, fears for James's safety grew during the winter of 1405 a Euro 6 and plans were made to send him to France. In February 1406, James was accompanying nobles close to his father when they clashed with supporters of Archibald, 4th Earl of Douglas, forcing the prince to take refuge in the castle of the Bass Rock, a small islet in the Firth of Forth. He remained there until mid-March, when he boarded a vessel bound for France, but on March 22 while off the English coast, pirates captured the ship and delivered James to Henry IV of England. Two weeks later, on April 4 the ailing Robert III died and the twelve-year-old uncrowned King of Scots began his eighteen-year detention. James was given a good education at the English court, where he developed respect for English methods of governance and for Henry V to the extent that he served in the English army against the French during 1420 Euro 1. The Scottish king's cousin Murdoch Stuart, Albany's son, a captive in England since 1402 was traded for Henry Percy, Earl of Northumberland in 1416. Eight more years passed before James was ransomed by which time Murdoch had succeeded his father to the dukedom and the governorship of Scotland. James married Joan Beaufort, daughter of the Earl of Somerset in February 1424 shortly before his release in April when they journeyed to Scotland. This was not altogether a popular re-entry to Scottish affairs, since James had fought on behalf of Henry V and at times against Scottish forces in France. Noble families would now not only have to pay increased taxes to cover the A40,000 ransom repayments but would also have to provide hostages as security. Despite this, James held qualities that were admired. The contemporary Scotty Chronicon by Walter Bauer described James as excelling at sport and appreciative of literature and music. Unlike his father and grandfather he did not take mistresses, but had many children by his consort, Queen Joan. The king had a strong desire to impose law and order on his subjects, but applied it selectively at times. To bolster his authority and secure the position of the crown, James launched preemptive attacks on some of his nobles beginning in 1425 with his close kinsman the Albany Stuarts resulting in the execution of Duke Murdoch and his sons. In 1428 James detained Alexander, Lord of the Isles, while attending a parliament in Inverness. Archibald. 5th Earl of Douglas, was arrested in 1431, followed by George, Earl of March, in 1434. The plight of the ransom hostages held in England was ignored and the repayment money was diverted into the construction of Linlithgow Palace and other grandiose schemes. In August 1436, James failed humiliatingly in his siege of the English-held Roxburgh Castle and then faced an ineffective attempt by Sir Robert Graham to arrest him at a general council. James was murdered at Perth on the night of 20 February 21, 1437, in a failed coup by his uncle and former ally Walter Stuart, Earl of Athol. Queen Joan, although wounded, managed to evade the attackers and was eventually reunited with her son James II in Edinburgh Castle. Prince and Steward of Scotland. James was probably born in late July 1394 in Dunfermline. 27 years after the marriage of his parents Robert III and Annabella Drummond. It was also at Dunfermline under his mother's care that James would have spent most of his early childhood. The prince was seven years old when his mother died in 1401 and a year later his elder brother David, Duke of Rothesay was probably murdered by their uncle Robert Stuart, Duke of Albany after being held at Albany's Falkland Castle. Prince James, now heir to the throne, was the only impediment to the transfer of the royal line to the Albany Stuarts. In 1402 Albany and his close black Douglas ally Archibald, 4th Earl of Douglas were absolved of any involvement in Rothesay's death clearing the way for Albany's reappointed as the king's lieutenant. Albany rewarded Douglas for his support by allowing him to resume hostilities in England. The Albany and Douglas affinity received a serious reversal in September 1402 when their large army was defeated by the English at Holmden and numerous prominent nobles and their followers were captured. These included Douglas himself, 
Alban is son Murdoch, and the Earls of Murray, Angus and Orkney. That same year, as well as the death of Rothesay, Alexander Leslie, Earl of Ross and Malcolm Drummond, Lord of Mar had also died. The void created by these events was inevitably filled by lesser men who had not previously been conspicuously politically active. In the years between 1402 and 1406, the northern earldoms of Ross, Murray and Mar were without adult leadership and with Murdoch Stuart, the justicia for the territory north of the Forth, a prisoner in England, Albany found himself reluctantly having to form an alliance with his brother Alexander Stuart, Earl of Buchan and Buchan's son, also called Alexander to hold back the ambitions of the Lord of the Isles. Douglas's absence from his power base in the Lothians and the Scottish marches encouraged King Robert's close allies Henry Sinclair, Earl of Orkney and Sir David Fleming of Bigger to take full advantage to become the principal political force in that region. In December 1404 the King granted the royal Stuart lands in the west, in Ayrshire and around the Firth of Clyde, to James in regality protecting them from outside interference and providing the prince with a territorial centre should the need arise. Yet, in 1405 James was under the protection and tutelage of Bishop Henry Wardlaw of St Andrews on the country's east coast. Douglas' animosity was intensifying because of the activities of Orkney and Fleming who continued to expand their involvement in border politics and foreign relations with England. Although a decision to send the young prince to France and out of Albany's reach was taken in the winter of 1405 Euro 6 James's departure from Scotland was unplanned. In February 1406 Bishop Wardlaw released James to Orkney and Fleming who, with their large force of Lothian adherents, proceeded into hostile Douglas East Lothian. James's custodians may have been giving a demonstration of royal approval to further their interests in Douglas country. This provoked a fierce response from James Douglas of Bilvany and his supporters who, at a place called Long Hermiston and Muir engaged with and killed Fleming while Orkney and James escaped to the comparative safety of the Bass Rock Islet in the Firth of Forth. They endured more than a month on there before boarding the Fraals bound Maringneet, a ship from Danzig. On March 22, 1406 the ship was taken by English pirates and James became the hostage of King Henry IV of England. Robert III was at Rothesay Castle when he learned of his son's capture and died soon after on April 4, 1406 and was buried in the Stuart Foundation Abbey of Paisley. King in captivity, James, now the young crowned King of Scots, began what proved to be his 18-year period as a hostage while at the same time Albany transitioned from his position of lieutenant to that of governor. Albany took James's lands under his own control depriving the king of income and any of the regalia of his position and was referred to in records as the son of the late king. The king had a small household of Scots that included Henry Sinclair, Earl of Orkney, Alexander Seaton, the nephew of Sir David Fleming, and Orkney's brother John Sinclair following the Earl's return to Scotland. In time, James's household a euro now paid for by the English a euro changed from high-ranking individuals to less notable men. Henry IV treated the young James well, providing him with a good education. James was ideally placed to observe Henry's methods of kingship and political control having probably been admitted into the royal household on reaching adulthood. James used personal visits from his nobles coupled with letters to individuals to maintain his visibility in his kingdom. Henry died in 1413 and his son, Henry V, immediately ended James's comparative freedom initially holding him in the Tower of London along with the other Scottish prisoners. One of these prisoners was James's cousin, Murdoch Stuart, Albany's son, who had been captured in 1402 at the Battle of Holmden Hill. Initially held apart but from 1413 until Murdoch's release in 1415 they were together in the Tower and at Windsor Castle. By 1420, James's standing at Henry V's court improved greatly. He ceased to be regarded as a hostage and more of a guest. James's value to Henry became apparent in 1420 when he accompanied the English king to France where his presence was used against the Scots fighting on the Dauphinist side. Following the English success at the Siege of Melun, a town southeast of Paris, the contingent of Scots were hanged for treason against their king. After his return to England, James attended Queen Catherine's coronation on February 23, 1421 receiving an honoured position of sitting immediately on the Queen's left at the coronation banquet. 
In March, Henry began a circuit of the important towns in England as a show of strength and it was during this tour that James was knighted on St. George's Day. By July, the two kings were back campaigning in France where James, evidently approving of Henry's methods of kingship, seemed content to endorse the English king's desire for the French crown. Henry appointed the Duke of Bedford and James as the joint commanders of the Siege of Dray on July 18, 1421 and on August 20 they received the surrender of the garrison. Henry died of dysentery on August 31, 1422 and in September James was part of the escort taking the English king's body back to London. The Regency Council of the Infant King Henry VI was inclined to have James released as soon as possible. In the early months of 1423 their attempts to resolve the issue met with little response from the Scots, clearly influenced by the Albany Stuarts and adherents. Archibald, Earl of Douglas was an astute and adaptable power in southern Scotland whose influence even eclipsed that of the Albany Stuarts. Despite his complicity in James's brother's death in Albany's castle in 1402 Douglas was still able to engage with the king. From 1421, Douglas had been in regular contact with James and they formed an alliance that was to prove pivotal in 1423. Although Douglas was the preeminent Scottish magnate his position in the borders and Lothians was geopoled easy to Euro not only did he have to forcibly retake Edinburgh Castle from his own designated warden but was very likely under threat from the Earls of Angus and March. In return for James's endorsement of Douglas's position in the kingdom, the Earl was able to deliver his affinity in the cause of the King's homecoming. Also, the relationship between Murdoch a Euro now Duke of Albany following his father's death in 1420 a Euro, and his own appointee Bishop William Lauder seemed to be under strain perhaps evidence of an influential grouping at odds with Murdoch's stance. Pressure from these advocates for the King almost certainly compelled Murdoch to agree to a general council in August 1423 when it was agreed that a mission should be sent to England to negotiate James's release. James's relationship with the House of Lancaster changed in February 1423 when he married Joan Beaufort, a cousin of Henry VI and the niece of Thomas, Duke of Exeter and Henry, Bishop of Winchester. A ransom treaty of a £40,000 sterling was agreed at Durham on March 28, 1424 to which James attached his own seal. The King and Queen escorted by English and Scottish nobles reached Melrose Abbey on April 5 and were met by Albany who relinquished his governor's seal of office. Personal Rule equals First Acts equals. Throughout the 15th century, Scottish kings suffered from a lack of crown revenue and James's reign was no exception. The Albany Regency had also been constrained with Duke Robert owed his fees of governorship. For the nobility, royal patronage ceased entirely following James's capture. Irregular forms of political favours emerged with Albany allowing nobles such as the Earl of Douglas and his brother James to remove funds from the customs. It was against this backdrop that James's coronation took place at Schoon on May 21, 1424. The coronation parliament of the three estates witnessed the king perform a knighthood ceremony for 18 prominent nobles including Alexander Stuart, Murdoch's son. An event probably intended to foster loyalty to the crown within the political community. Called primarily to discuss issues surrounding the finance of the ransom payments, the parliament heard James underline his position and authority as monarch. He ensured the passing of legislation designed to substantially improve crown income by revoking the patronage of royal predecessors and guardians. The Earls of Douglas and Mar were immediately affected by this when their ability to remove large sums from the customs was blocked. Despite this, James was still dependent on the Nobilitia Euro especially Doug Lyser Euro for its support and initially adopted a less confrontational stance. The early exception to this was Walter Stewart. Albany's son. Walter was the heir to the earldom of Lennox and had been in open revolt against his father during 1423 for not giving way to his younger brother Alexander for this title. He also disagreed with his father's acquiescence to the return of James to Scotland. James had Walter arrested on May 13, 1424 and imprisoned on the Bass Rock a Euro at this time, this was probably in Murdoch's interest as well as James's. It is probable that the king felt unable to move against the rest of the Albany Stuarts while Murdoch's brother, John Stuart, 
Earl of Buchan and Archibald, Earl of Douglas were fighting the English on the Dauphinist cause in France. Buchan, a leader with an international reputation, commanded the large Scottish army but both he and Douglas fell at the Battle of Vernal in August 1424 and the Scottish army routed. The loss of his brother and the large fighting force left Murdoch politically exposed. Equals a ruthless and acquisitive king equals, Douglas's death at Vernuil was to weaken the position of his son Archibald, the fifth earl. On October 12, 1424, the king and Archibald met at Melrose Abbey ostensibly to agree the appointment of John Foggo, a monk of Melrose, to the abbacy. The meeting may also have been intended as an official acceptance of Douglas but it signalled a change in the Black Douglas predominance vis-à-vis -vis the Crown and other nobles. Important Douglas allies died in France and some of their heirs realigned with rival nobles through blood ties while at the same time Douglas experienced a loosening of allegiances in the Lothians and, with the loss of his command over Edinburgh Castle, this all served to improve James's position. Even though, James continued to retain Black Douglas support allowing him to begin a campaign of political alienation of Albany and his family. The king's rancor directed at Duke Murdoch had its roots in the past a Euro Duke Robert was responsible for his brother David's death and neither Robert nor Murdoch exerted themselves in negotiating James's release and must have left the king with the suspicion that they held aspirations for the throne itself. Buchan's lands did not fall to the Albany Stuarts but were forfeited by the crown, Albany's father-in-law, Duncan, Earl of Lennox was imprisoned and in December the Duke's main ally Alexander Stuart. Earl of Mar settled his differences with the king. An acrimonious sitting of Parliament in March 1425 precipitated the arrest of Murdoch, Isabella, his wife, and his son Alexander a Euro of Albany's other sons Walter was already in prison and James, his youngest, also known as James the Fat, escaped into the Lennox. James the Fat led the men of Lennox and Argyll in open rebellion against the Crown and this may have been what the King needed to bring a charge of treason against the Albany Stuarts. Murdoch, his sons Walter and Alexander and Duncan, Earl of Lennox were in Stirling Castle for their trial on May 18 at a specially convened Parliament. An assize of seven earls and fourteen lesser nobles were appointed to hear the evidence that linked the prisoners to the rebellion in the Lennox. The four men were condemned. Walter on May 24 and the others on May 25 and immediately beheaded in front of the castle. James demonstrated a ruthless and avish side to his nature and the destruction of his close family, the Albany Stuarts, that yielded the three forfeited earldoms of Fife, Menteith and Lennox. An inquiry set up by James in 1424 into the dispersal of Crown estates since the reign of Robert I exposed legal defects in a number of transactions where the earldoms of Mar, March and Strathairn together with the Black Douglas lordships of Selkirk and Wigtown were found to be problematic. Strathairn and March were forfeited in 1427 and 1435 respectively. Mar was forfeited in 1435 on the Earl's death without heir which also meant that the lordships of Garioch and Badenoch reverted to the crown. James sought to boost his income further through taxation and succeeded in getting Parliament to pass legislation in 1424 for a tax to go towards paying off the ransom a euro a £26,000 was raised but James sent only a £12,000 to England. By 1429, James stopped the ransom payments completely and used the remainder of the taxation on buying cannons and luxury goods from Flanders. Following a fire in the castle of Linlithgow in 1425, funds were also diverted to the building of Linlithgow Palace which continued until James's death in 1437 and absorbed an estimated one-tenth of royal income. Equals relations with the church equals. James asserted his authority not only over the nobility but also upon the church and lamented that King David I's benevolence towards the church proved costly to his successors and that he was a sere sank to the crown. James also considered that the monastic institutions in particular needed improvement and that they should return to being strictly ordered communities. Part of James's solution was to create an assembly of overseeing abbots and followed this up by establishing a Carthusian priory at Perth to provide other religious houses with an example of internal conduct. He also sought to influence church attitudes to his policies by having his own clerics appointed to the bishoprics of Dunblane, Dunkeld, Glasgow and Murray. In March 1425, 
James's Parliament directed that all bishops must instruct their clerics to offer up prayers for the king and his family. A year later, Parliament toughened up this edict insisting that the prayers be given at every mass under sanction of a fine and severe rebuke. This same Parliament legislated that every person in Scotland should be governed under the king's laws and statutes of this realm only. From this, Laws were enacted in 1426 to restrict the actions of prelates whether it was to regulate their need to travel to the Roman Curia or their ability to purchase additional ecclesiastical positions while there. In James's Parliament of July 1427, it is evident that statute being enacted had the purpose of reducing the powers of the church jurisdiction. On July 25, 1431, the General Council of the Church convened in Basel but its initial full meeting did not take place until December 14 by which time Pope Eugenius and the Council were in complete disagreement. It was the Council and not the Pope who requested that James send representatives of the Scottish Church and it is known that two delegates a Euro Abbot Thomas Livingston of Dundrenan and then John de Winchester, Canon of Murray and a servant of the King Euro were in attendance in November and December 1432. In 1433 James, this time in response to a summons by the Pope, appointed two bishops, two abbots and four dignitaries to attend the council. Twenty Euro eight Scottish ecclesiasts attended at intervals from 1434 to 1437 but the majority of the higher-ranking churchmen sent proxy attendees but bishops John Cameron of Glasgow and John de Cronach of Brecon attended in person as did Abbot Patrick Wotherspoon of Holyrood. Even in the midst of the Basel General Council, Pope Eugenius instructed his legate, Bishop Antonio Alton of Urbino, to meet with James to raise the issue of the king's controversial anti-barratory laws of 1426. The Bishop of Urbino arrived in Scotland in December 1436 and apparently a reconciliation between James and the papal legate had taken place by the middle of February 1437 but the events of February 21 when James was assassinated prevented the legate from completing his commission. Equals the Highland problem equals, in July 1428, the king convened a general council at Perth aimed at obtaining finance for an expedition to the Highlands against the semi-autonomous Lord of the Isles. The council initially resisted granting James the funds a euro even with royal support from the powerful earls of Mar and Athol a euro it eventually gave into the king a euro unregistered trademark s wishes. Although it seemed that an all-out attack on the gales of the north was not the king's intention, James had resolved to use a degree of force to strengthen royal authority. He told the assembly, the leaders of the Gaelic kindreds in the north and west were summoned by James ostensibly to a sitting of parliament in Inverness. Of those assembled the king arrested around fifty of them including Alexander, the third lord of the Isles and his mother, Mary, Countess of Ross around August 24. A few were executed but the remainder, with the exception of Alexander and his mother, quickly released. During Alexander a Euro unregistered trademark s captivity James attempted to split clan da squared Manila Euro Alexander's uncle John Mar Cubda was approached by an agent of the king to take the clan leadership but his refusal to have any dealings with the king while his nephew was held prisoner led to John Mar Cubda's attempted arrest and death. The king's need for allies in the western north led him to soften his approach towards the Lord of the Isles and, hoping that Alexander would now become a loyal servant of the crown, he was given his freedom. Alexander, probably under pressure from his close kinsman Donald Ballock, John Mar Cubdar's son, and Alistair Karach of Luachaber, led a rebellion attacking the castle and burgh of Inverness in spring 1429. The crisis deepened when a fleet from the lordship was dispatched to bring James the Fat back from Ulster to convey him home that he might be king. With James a Euro unregistered trademark s intention to form an alliance with the Ulster O'Donnells of Tyraconnell against the Macdonalds, the English became distrustful of the Scottish King Euro unregistered trademark s motives and they themselves tried to bring James the Fat to England. Before he could become an active player, James the Fat died suddenly releasing James to prepare for decisive action against the Lordship. The armies met on June 21 in Luachaber and Alexander, suffering the defection of Clan Shatton and Clan Cameron, was heavily defeated. Alexander escaped probably to Islay but James continued his assault on the lordship by taking the strongholds of Dingwall and Urquhart castles in July. 
the king pushed home his advantage when an army reinforced with artillery was dispatched to the Isles. Alexander probably realized that his position was hopeless and tried to negotiate terms of surrender but James demanded and received his total submission. From August 1429 the king delegated royal authority to Alexander Stuart, Earl of Mar for the keeping of the peace in the north and west. The Islesmen rose again in September 1431 and inflicted two important defeats on the king's men a Euro Mars army was beaten at Inverlochy and Angus Maria Euro unregistered trademark s in a fierce battle near Tongue in Kethness. This was a serious setback for James and his credibility was adversely affected. In 1431, before the September uprising, the king had arrested two of his nephews, John Kennedy of Carrick and Archibald, Earl of Douglas possibly as a result of a conflict between John and his uncle, Thomas Kennedy in which Douglas may have become involved. Douglas's arrest had raised tensions in the country and James acted to reduce the unrest by freeing the Earl on September 29 the Euro it was quite likely that the King made the Earl's release conditional on support at the forthcoming Parliament at Perth at which James intended to push for further funding for the campaign against the Lordship. Parliament was in no mood to allow James unconditional backing a euro he was allowed a tax to fund his Highland campaign but Parliament retained full control over the levy. The rules Parliament attached to the taxation indicated a robust stand against further conflict in the north and probably led to the turnaround that took place on October 22 when the King forgave the offence of each Earl, namely Douglas and Ross, that is Alexander. For Douglas this was a formal acknowledgement of his having already been freed three weeks earlier but for Alexander this was a total reversal of crown policy towards the lordship. Four summer campaigns against the lordship were now officially at an end with James's wishes having effectively been blocked by Parliament. Equals foreign policy equals, James's release in 1424 did not herald a new Scottish relationship with its southern neighbour. He didn't become the submissive king that the English council had hoped for but instead emerged as a confident and independently minded European monarch. The only substantive matters of contention between the two kingdoms were the payments due under the terms of James's release and the renewal of the truce that would expire in 1430. In 1428 after setbacks on the battlefield Charles VII of France sent his ambassador Ragnald of Chartres. Archbishop of Reims to Scotland to persuade James to renew the Old Alliance a Euro the terms were to include the marriage of the Princess Margaret to Louis, the Dauphin of France, and a gift to the province of Saint-Onge to James. The ratification of the treaty by Charles took place in October 1428 and James, now with the intended marriage of his daughter into the French royal family and the possession of French lands, had his political importance in Europe boosted. The effectiveness of the alliance with France had virtually ceased after Vernal and its renewal in 1428 did not alter that a Euro James adopted a much more non-aligned position with England, France and Burgundy while at the same time opening up diplomatic contacts with Aragon, Austria, Castile, Denmark, Milan, Naples and the Vatican. Generally, Scott over Euro-English relations were relatively amiable and an extension of the truce until 1436 helped the English cause in France and the promises made in 1428 of the Scottish army to help Charles VII and the marriage of James's eldest daughter to the French king's son Louis were unrealized. James had to balance his European responses carefully a Euro-England's ally, the Duke of Burgundy whose possessions included Scotland's major trading partners, the Low Countries ensured support for France would be muted. The truce with England expired in May 1436 but James's perception of the Anglo-French conflict changed following a realignment of the combatants. The breakdown of the talks between England and France in 1435 precipitated an alliance between Burgundy and France and a request from France for Scottish involvement in the war and for the fulfilment of the promised marriage of Princess Margaret to the Dauphin. In the spring of 1436 Princess Margaret sailed to France and in August Scotland entered the war with James leading a large army to lay siege to the English enclave of Roxburgh Castle. The campaign was to prove pivotal, the Book of Plus Carden describes a detestable split and most unworthy difference arising from jealousy within the Scottish camp and the historian Michael Brown explains that a contemporary source has James appointing his young and inexperienced cousin Robert Stuart of Athol as the constable of the host ahead of the experienced March Wardens, the Earls of Douglas and Angus. 
Brown explains that both Earls possessed considerable local interests and that the effects of such a large army living off the land may have created considerable resentment and hostility in the area. When the militant prelates of York and Durham together with the Earl of Northumberland took their forces into the marches to relieve the fortress, the Scots swiftly retreated. A Euro a chronicle written a year later said that the Scots had fled wretchedly and ignominiously a Euro, but the effects and the manner of the defeat and the loss of their expensive artillery was a major reversal for James both in terms of foreign policy and internal authority. Assassination equals Background equals Walter Stewart was the youngest of Robert II's sons and the only one not to have been provided with an earldom during his father's lifetime. Walter's brother, David, Earl of Strathairn and Cathness had died before March 5, 1389 when his daughter Euphemia was first recorded as Countess of Strathairn. Walter, now ward to his niece, administered Strathairn for the next decade and a half during which time he aided his brother Robert. Earl of Fife and Guardian of Scotland by enforcing law and order upon another brother Alexander, Lord of Bad and Oka Euro he again supported Robert against their nephew, David, Duke of Rothesay in 1402. Albany most likely engineered the marriage of Ephemia to one of his affinity, Patrick Graham and by doing so ended Walter's involvement in Strathian. Duke Robert, possibly to make up for the loss of the fruits of Strathian, made Walter Earl of Athol and Lord of Mpfen. In 1413, Graham was killed in a quarrel with his own principal servant in the earldom, John Drummond. The Drummond kindred were close to Athol and the earl's renewed involvement in Strathairn as ward to Graham's son despite strong opposition from Albany hind at Athol's possible party to the murder. The bad blood now existing between Albany and Athol led James on his return to Scotland in 1424 to ally himself with Earl Walter, his uncle. Athol participated at the assize that sat over the 24-May 25, 1425 that tried and found the prominent members of the Albany Stuarts guilty of rebellion a Euro their executions followed swiftly. James granted Athol the positions of Sheriff of Perth and Justicia and also the Earldom of Strathian but this, significantly, in life rent only a Euro acts that confirmed Earl Walter's policing remit given by Albany and his already effective grip on Strathian. Athol's elder son, David had been one of the hostages sent to England as a condition of James's release and had died there in 1434 a Euro his younger son, Alan died in the king's service at the Battle of Inverlochy in 1431. David's son Robert was now Athol's heir and both were now in line to the throne after the young Prince James. James continued to show favour to Athol and appointed his grandson Robert as his personal chamberlain but by 1437, after a series of setbacks at the hands of James, the Earl and Robert probably viewed the King's actions as a prelude to further acquisitions at Athol's expense. Athol's hold on the rich earldom of Strathairn was weak and both he and Robert would have realised that after the Earl's death Strathairn would have reverted to the crown. This meant that Robert's holdings would have been the relatively impoverished earldoms of Kethness and Athol and amounted to no more than what was in the Earl Walter's possession in the years between 1406 and 1416. The retreat from Roxburgh exposed the king to questions regarding his control over his subjects, his military competence and his diplomatic abilities yet he remained determined to continue with the war against England. Just two months after the Roxburgh fiasco, James called a general council in October 1436 to finance further hostilities through more taxation. The estates firmly resisted this and their opposition was articulated by their speaker Sir Robert Graham, a former Albany attendant but now a servant of Athol. The council then witnessed an unsuccessful attempt by Graham to arrest the king resulting in the knight's imprisonment followed by banishment but James did not see Graham's actions as part of any extended threat. In January 1437, Athol received yet another rebuff in his own heartlands when James overturned the chapter of Dunkeld Cathedral whose nominee was replaced by the king's nephew and firm supporter, James Kennedy. Equals conspiracy and regicide equals. The reaction against the king at the General Council had shown Athol that James was not only on the back foot but his political standing had received a huge setback and may have convinced the Earl that James's death was now a viable course of action. Athol had seen how assertive action by two of his brothers at different times had allowed them to take control of the kingdom and that as James's nearest adult relative, 
the Earl must have considered that decisive intervention on his part at this time could prove to be equally successful. The destruction of the Albany Stuarts in 1425 appears to have played a significant part in the conspiracy against the king. Their judicial killing and forfeiture of their lands impacted on the servants who administered and depended on these estates for their living. The vacuum left by this was filled by Athol in whose employment many of these disaffected Albany men appear. These included Sir Robert Graham who only three months earlier had attempted to arrest the king at the Perth Council, and the brothers Christopher and Robert Chambers. Even although Robert Chambers was a member of the royal household, the old Albany ties were stronger. A general council was held in Athol's heartland in Perth on February 4, 1437 and crucially for the conspirators, the king and queen had remained in the town at their lodgings in the Blackfriars Monastery. In the evening of February 20, 1437 the king and queen were in their rooms and separated from most of their servants. Athol's grandson and heir Robert Stuart, the king's chamberlain, allowed his co-conspirator Sir Euro thought to number about thirty a Euro led by Robert Graham and the chamber's brothers access to the building. James was alerted to the men's presence giving the king time to hide in a sewer tunnel but with its exit recently blocked off to prevent tennis balls getting lost. James was trapped and killed. Equals aftermath equals, the assassins had achieved their priority in killing the king but the queen, although wounded, had escaped. Importantly, the six-year-old king, now James II, had been safeguarded from Athol's control by the removal of the Earl's associate, John Spence, from his role as James's custodian. Spence vanished from the records following the regicide but the reallocation of his positions and lands immediately following the murder indicate his part in the plot. Yet, in the chaos following the murder, it appeared that the Queen's attempt to position herself as regent was not guaranteed. No surviving documentation exists that suggests that there was any general feeling of horror or condemnation aimed at the murderers. It was possible that had the botched attempt at killing the Queen succeeded and had Athol taken control of the young king then his attempted coup might have succeeded. The Queen's small group of loyal supporters that included the Earl of Angus and William Crichton ensured her continued hold of James. This in itself greatly reinforced her situation but Athol still had followers. By the first week of March neither side seemed to have ascendancy and the Bishop of Urbino, the Pope's envoy, called for the council to pursue a peaceful outcome. Despite this by the middle of March it is probable that both Angus and Crichton had mobilized to move against Athol. It is equally likely that Athol had gathered his forces to resist incursions into his heartland Sir Euro on March 7 the Queen and the council entreated the Burgess of Perth to resist the forces of the Felon traitors. The position of Athol and his circle of close supporters only collapsed after Earl Walter's heir Robert Stuart had been captured and who, in Shirley's account, confessed to his part in the crime. Walter was taken prisoner by Angus and held at the Edinburgh Tollbooth where he was tried and beheaded on March 26, 1437, the day after the coronation of the young James II. Sir Robert Graham the leader of the band of assassins was captured by former Athol allies and was tried at a session of the council sitting at Stirling Castle and subsequently executed sometime shortly after April 9. Queen Joan's pursuit of the regency ended probably at the Council of June 1437 when Archibald, 5th Earl of Douglas was appointed to act as Lieutenant General of the Kingdom. King James' embalmed heart may have been taken on pilgrimage to the Holy Land following his interment at Perth Charter House, as the Exchequer Rolls of Scotland for 1443 note the payment of a £90 to cover the costs of a Knight of the Order of St John who had returned it to the Charter House from the island of Rhodes. Historiography James was a paradoxical figure. Although a prisoner of England he still received a good education and developed into a cultured individual becoming a poet an accomplished musician and skilled in sports. Walter Bauer, abbot of Inchcombe, lists James's qualities as a musician a euro not just as an enthusiastic amateur but a master, another Orpheus. His mastery included the organ, drum, flute and lyre. James's sporting abilities such as wrestling, hammer throwing, archery and jousting are also listed by Bauer. He described James as possessing an eagerness in literary composition and writing, the best known of which is his love poem, The Kinja Square. Bauer characterized the king as a tower, a lion, a light, 
a jewel, a pillar and a leader and was our lawgiver king who ended the thieving, dishonest conduct and plundering. Abbot Bauer also described the king as capable of stabbing a near relative through the hand for creating a disturbance at court. The abbot was generally supportive of James but that he and others regretted the demise of the Albany Stuarts and that he was confounded by James's greed for territory and wealth. Although Bauer didn't dwell at length on the negative aspects of James's character he alluded to the dismay of even those close to the king at his harsh regime. John Shirley's account of the events leading up to James's murder in the work The Death of the King of Scotus provided an accurate narrative of politics in Scotland and which must have depended upon knowledgeable witnesses. The Death describes James as tyrannous and whose actions were motivated by revenge and covertised and for any lawful cause. Shirley agrees with Bower as far as the Albany Stuarts were concerned when he wrote that the Albanys whose death the people of the land saw grudged and moaned. Writing nearly a century later both the chroniclers John Meyer and Hector Boyce relied extensively on Bauer for their own narratives. They described James as the embodiment of good monarchy with Meyer's eulogy that James indeed excelled by far in virtue his father, grandfather and his great-grandfather nor will I give precedence over the first James to any of the Stuarts while Boyce in similar vein calls James the most virtuous prince that ever was Afwa his days. Late in the 16th century the early historians George Buchanan and Bishop John Leslie from opposite ends of the religious spectrum both looked favorably on James's reign but were uneasily mindful of an enduring aggressive history regarding the king. The first 20th century history of James I was written by E. W. M. Balfour Melville in 1936 and continued the theme of James as the strong upholder of law and order and when describing Albany's trial and execution he writes the king has proved that high rank was no defense for lawlessness. The crown was enriched by the revenues of Fife, Menteith and Lennox. Balfour Melville views James as a lawmaker and a reformer whose legislation was aimed at not only increasing the position of the king but of parliament. Michael Lynch describes how James's positive reputation began immediately after his death when the Bishop of Urbino kissed James's wounds and declared him to be a martyr. He suggests that the praise of the pro-James Scottish chroniclers and also of some modern historians to find strong kings to applaud should not diminish the extent of Parliament's ability to restrain the king nor minimize the confrontation that took place between James and a more self-assured Parliament. Stephen Boardman takes the view that by the time of his death James had succeeded in breaking down the constraints on the exercise of royal authority which were rooted in the settlement of the kingdom by Robert II. Christine McGladdery describes how opposing views were the result of competing propaganda after the murder. To those who were glad to see the king dead, James was a tyrant who without reason aggressively assailed the nobility imposing forfeiture on their estates and who failed to deliver justice to his people. She also provides the opposite viewpoint that the king was seen as giving strong leadership against magnet excesses and that the murder was a disaster for the Scottish people leaving them to endure the instability of years of consequent faction fighting. McGladdery continues that James was the example for the Stuart kings to follow by putting Scotland firmly within a European context. Michael Brown describes James as an able, aggressive and opportunistic politician whose chief aim was to establish a monarchy that had stature and was free from the confrontations that had beset his father's reign. He characterizes James as capable of highly effective short-term interventions yet had failed to achieve a position of unqualified authority. Brown writes that James had come to power after fifty years when kings looked like magnets and magnets acted like kings and succeeded in completely changing the outlook and objectives of the monarchy. His policy of reducing the power and influence of the magnets, continued by his son James II, led to a more subordinate nobility. Alexander Grant repudiates James's reputation as the lawgiver and explains that nearly all of the king's legislation were reconstructs of laws laid down by previous monarchs and concludes that the idea of James's return in 1424 marks a turning point in the development of Scots law is an exaggeration. At James's death only the Douglases of the predominant magnetial houses was left and, according to Grant, this reduction was the most far-reaching change to the nobility and was by far the most important consequence of James I's reign. Marriage and Issue On February 2, 1424, he married, in London, Joan Beaufort, daughter of John Beaufort, 1st Earl of Somerset and Margaret Holland. 
Together they had eight children, Margaret Stewart, married the Dauphin Louis, future Louis XI of France, at Tours, June 24, 1436. Isabella Stewart, married Francis I, Duke of Brittany, at Uri, October 30, 1442. Joan Stewart. She was deaf and dumb, known as the Dumb Lady of Dalkeith. Married on 1459 to James Douglas, 1st Earl of Morton. Alexander Stuart, Duke of Rothesay, elder twin of James II. James II of Scotland. Elena Stuart, married Sigismund, Archduke of Austria, at Moran, February 12, 1449. Mary Stuart, Countess of Buchan, married Wolfert VI of Borsalin in 1444. Annabella Stuart, married firstly December 14, 1447 Louis of Savoy, Count of Geneva, secondly in 1458 George Gordon, second Earl of Huntley. Ancestry Fictional portrayals James I has been depicted in plays, historical novels and short stories. They include, The Caged Lion by Charlotte Mary Yonge. The novel depicts the captivity of James I in the Kingdom of England, with the main events taking place in 1421 to 1422. A friendly relationship with Henry V of England is prominently featured. Catherine of Vaulois and Richard Whittington are the most prominent among the secondary characters. A King's Tragedy by May Wynne. The novel depicts events of the years 1436 to 1437. The action leads to the assassination of James I. Catherine Douglas is among the characters featured. Lion Let Loose by Nigel Tranter. Covers the life of James I from C. 1405 to his death in 1437. A Royal Poet by Washington Irving. The author muses over the greatness of James I while on an excursion to Windsor Castle, mentioning two of his poems, The Kinji Square, and Christa Euro Unregistered Trademark S. Kirk of the Green. James I, The Key Will Keep the Lock by Rona Munro. A co-production between the National Theatre of Scotland, Edinburgh International Festival and the National Theatre of Great Britain. The James plays a Euro James I, James II and James III a Euro or a trio of history plays by Rona Munro. Each play stands alone as a vision of a country tussling with its past and future. This play focuses on the personal development of James I after his release by Henry V of England, his marriage to Joan and the struggles with the noble families in order to establish his authority in Scotland. Explanatory Notes References Sources External links <laughs>